I guess we're on time, so um, we'll get started. Thank you for coming. Um, good morning. My name is Yasser. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Connectera. Uh, we're based out in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Uh, flew in about two nights ago, uh, so it's great to be here. Um, I guess I'll start with a quick introduction and then get right into this, this talk today. Um, so I was at Microsoft for about 12 years prior to starting Connectera, which is now um, a seven-year-old startup. Um, as I mentioned, we're headquarters in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And when I moved to the Netherlands, I ended up living on a daily farm. So as you can imagine, uh, being at Microsoft, I didn't really know a whole lot about dairy or farming, um, but ended up living um, in a very small rural village, um, and my house was smack bang in the middle of a pasture. Um, and that's how I got introduced to dairy, and that's where the whole idea of Connectera started. And my, uh, my background was in tech. I did quite some bit of work in AI. Back when AI wasn't a thing at all, uh, it was way ahead of its time when we started working on it. And I had some pretty interesting experiences with smart cities and sensors. So I was uh, listening to the keynote speaker this morning, and I was like, oh, this is fantastic, because it's a great tee up to the conversation today. So what I wanted to do in, in this conversation um, about AI and agriculture is really make it real. I'm not going to go too much into how the tech actually works or uh, uh, the technical details of it, but feel free to ask any questions if you have at the end of the session. We have some time for Q&A as well. So let's get right into it. <clears throat> and I'm gonna start with this one. These are two images um, of which you can see the prompt at the top. And you go to this website, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, you probably know about it already. And you give this computer um, website a prompt and it will generate art for you. The one on the left is I sort of gave it a prompt that said, hey, show me a 3D render of what you think is going to be the future of dairy farming. And this is what it came up with. The one on the right was a slightly more creative prompt, which was two engineers working to solve climate change using technology in the style of Vincent van Gogh. And that's what that came up with. And the really interesting thing about these two images is that these are original works of art made by an AI algorithm. These are not existing copies. None of this actually exists. It actually made them. And its name is Dali. Dali's been the work of a company called OpenAI. And this company has recently gotten very popular for this. How many of you here, show of fans, know of ChatGPT or have heard about this thing? Okay, all right, it's a couple. ChatGPT <clears throat> is a AI algorithm that has recently launched, and by, they've been working on this for a couple of years. And similar to the previous example that I showed you, this one is what's called a large language model. Essentially, what data scientists have been doing is training an algorithm to understand language. And it has gotten so good, and it has gotten so powerful, and I'll talk a little bit about that, that these are two examples of prompts or questions that you can ask this algorithm, and at the bottom, you'll see the answer. So, write a poem about the future of an AI attempting to write poetry. And that's what the answer was. On the right is a prompt to this algorithm saying, pretend you're a professor and write me a script for something that I'm about to make a pitch. And you can get very creative with all of this. The responses that you're getting from these algorithms are almost indistinguishable from what a human response would be. This is a huge leap in what's happening in technology today. It's called ChatGPT, and you should check it out. Unfortunately, you will not be able to 
uh, use it because it has gotten so popular that they temporarily had to stop new users uh, getting onto the platform. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a couple of slides. <clears throat> the consequences of ChatGPT and DALI are just beginning to emerge. On the left is a two-day-old bit of news, actually, where universities and schools are now beginning to scramble to figure out how do we contain students who are actually getting onto chat GPT and asking them, asking this algorithm to write their homework for them because the homework is so good that, and you cannot distinguish it from what a student would write. And this is a real dilemma because this content cannot be distinguished by most people. This is written by an algorithm. And on the right is a really interesting story because OpenAI is not the only company working on this. Um, Google's been working on a similar model uh, within their group called DeepMind. And a few months ago, I think it's about eight months ago or something like that, <clears throat> there was this really interesting um, situation brewing in Google where a engineer who's been working on their chatbot or their language model um, was chatting with this algorithm. They were having a full-on conversation, and the conversation became uh, pretty deep and meaningful where they were debating uh, the point of life and the role of existence and all that. And at the end of that conversation, um, he basically put his hands up and said, I think this algorithm is actually alive. It is sentient. And he decided to make a blog post, and if you Google this, you'll find the blog post and that entire conversation, actually. Um, and he made this blog post, and eventually Google fired him, saying, well, you breached your terms of confidentiality. But the whole uproar was that if the engineer who's actually working on this algorithm thinks the algorithm is sentient and that Google fires him, what does that say about what they're working on? I'll leave that for now. Um, but the, the point that I'm trying to illustrate is where technologies, and especially where AI, is heading, and the capabilities of this technology today. But um, I should also show you this, and there are other examples. They're not perfect. They are language models which can understand human language, and they can respond in human language, but there are still problems with it. This is one example. It's exactly the same. 270 minutes is not greater than four hours and 30 minutes. It's exactly the same. But the authoritative response of this will throw some people off because the way that it writes is so confident and authoritative. And chat GPT has some ways to go. However, the popularity of these technologies and their adoption outside of the dairy world today um, in general is pretty astounding. Um, this is an example of how long it took some of the most, the fastest growing companies that we've known today in tech to achieve one million active users. From three and a half years that it took Netflix, which was considered astronomical growth, ChatGPT got to one million users in five days. And it's grown so fast, like I said, they've had to stop onboarding new users. Now, the statistic does not correct for uh, the fact that Netflix is an older company. There were fewer internet users at the time. So you could argue a little bit about the correction, but directionally, it is pretty astounding how fast it got to one million users. Now, this particular um, conversation that we're having, or this chat that I'm having with you today, um, I wrote this, um, this deck maybe about uh, I think it was about six months ago, and this slide was different. And this slide said, well, these language models are pretty interesting, and the examples that I had at the time were a little bit more pedestrian. Um, but I had to change this slide, because what's happened in the last six months has changed my view on how fast this technology is, is evolving and the impact that it will have on all of us. It's my opinion that what's happening in the world of AI is going to have an impact that's bigger than the launch of the internet back in the, in the early 90s. 
this is fundamentally going to change things um, and technologies that we're using. And one example that I can give you is that OpenAI, <coughs> ChatGPT and DALI, is actually funded by Microsoft. Brilliant move, they invested a billion dollars into OpenAI a few years ago. And one of the places you're probably going to see, and again, this is speculation, there's some news around this, we are probably going to see ChatGPT come up, is going to be in Microsoft Word and Excel. Um, anybody here remember Clippy? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Well, Clippy's got an upgrade, guys, and it has gotten pretty seriously good. Um, so you're going, we're probably going to see this appear in Microsoft uh, technologies, and it is going to fundamentally then change the way that we've been doing things, because I'm pretty sure that a lot of us use that technology. But I did promise that I'll talk about AI in agriculture and not just AI overall. Um, pretty much every aspect of a farm, specific, or a dairy farm, if you may, has an AI-driven use case. There is something that we're doing on a daily basis on the farm that I can tell you there's an application of AI for that. And what I want to do in the rest of the conversation today is talk a little bit about those and see how we can solve some of these real-world challenges. Speaking of challenges, one that I'm particularly interested in is this one, and that's about climate change. And that's about what is happening with, and can we use AI to solve for climate change, and agriculture in general has a role to play in solving for this challenge. Yes, there is a contribution, but yes, we are also part of the solution for this challenge. Well, we are in Wisconsin, and as Kelso said, well, I don't necessarily control the weather, but yes, I can do something about it. So if we look at some of the data that's coming out from um, Our World in Data, which is a pretty well-respected site that collects and analyzes a lot of these trends, there are two areas that I picked out which are interesting for us to look at. The first is yields. Can we make farms more efficient? If we can make farms more efficient, by definition what that means is we're producing more with less emissions per unit of production. So question number one is can we get farms more efficient? If we do that, we're able to reduce the methane impact per calorie, if you may. The second is, can we start to implement best, farm, sorry, um, best practices on farms at scale? And that raises the question, what is a best practice? And how do you define a best practice? What data do you have that demonstrates it is a best practice? And this is something which I, these two areas are something that I want to talk about today of the application of AI in dairy. So here's one example. This is um, some of the work that my team's been doing. Um, not making a sales pitch, but uh, it's a good example that I thought would be relevant. Some of the algorithms that we've built, we call this one AskIDA, actually enables you to track the impact of different decisions that you're making in your operation. So one of the questions that you could formulate with IDA is, hey, I want you to track the impact of heat stress on my milk yield and milk production. You could technically give it any event that's occurred on your farm or is about to occur, so a change in bedding, a change in feed, um, a change in your uh, stock density, for instance, and then ask the algorithm to say, hey, what happened to my milk production? If you have sensors, you could say, all right, I've changed bedding. I expect that laying time should increase. Or I've changed my feed and I expect my solids to change. And the algorithm can begin to figure out and pinpoint the impact of this change across your operation, which can then actually give you conclusive evidence if this was a positive or negative change. And you can then calculate the ROI that comes with it. It's a pretty good roadmap to get to identifying best practices. And this is one example, a simple example nevertheless, of the use of AI. <clears throat> this one gets a little bit more interesting. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this curve. 
Yes. All right. So this is a um, lactation curve of a dairy cow. Um, the gray part is the milk yield. The green and orange ones are fat and protein. So we've been working on a algorithm, which it's not particularly unique, um, is to predict the lactation curve of a dairy cow. And there have been many such um, attempts to be done in the past, but we used a different type of technology to do this. And what we found is that the use of AI in this space resulted in a really, really low error rate, which was less than 0.8%. Our deviations were very, very low. But what surprised us, and this was a surprise to us as well, is that the algorithm was able to not just predict milk yield, it could also predict fat and protein. And it was able to do this with very little amounts of data. Now the thing with AI algorithms is you don't always know how the algorithm actually learned. You oftentimes are like, well, that's what it did, so yeah, we'll take it. And that's what happened in this, in this case. And what we did um, <clears throat> as an experiment is that we said, okay, now we've, we have this really interesting milk yield model, but what we're going to do is we're going to try and make use out of this model. So, um, <clears throat> the scenario that we wanted to play out was the following. Imagine if you have a dairy cow, a healthy dairy cow, you will get a nice lactation curve that looks like this. However, what if this cow gets sick? What happens then? So, this is what we set up the experiment to do. The dots that you see are the actual milk yield of this dairy cow. The gray line is what the algorithm predicted this cow's milk yield should be. So the experiment that we ran is that we gave the algorithm the data of this cow to about 110 days in milk. And the cow got sick somewhere around 120 days in milk. Therefore, its milk yield dropped. Now, because we know that our algorithm is really good at predicting, the difference between what she should have done and what she actually did because she got sick is the cost of this health incident. Really interesting insight. But not only the fact that this is the cost of the health insight, you can also now compute the loss in greenhouse gas efficiency because the cow produced less but pretty much emits the same amount of methane, assuming that the feed is constant. So the question over here that we were starting to look at was, okay, if you had this, if you prevented this health issue, you would have also had a more efficient lactation from a greenhouse gas emissions standpoint. Therefore, you can express health issues as emission costs as well. Interesting. But what we hear a lot of our customers, and when I talk to producers, they say, well, yeah, sir, look, this is all quite nice and interesting and sounds very sciencey. Um, the thing is, well, when I have to make all of these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, and I have a lot to do every day, how can you help me figure out that if I make decisions that are going to help make farms more efficient from a sustainability standpoint, that they won't have an impact on my ROI, or they won't have a cost impact, or they won't have a yield impact for us. Now the next slide's a little bit complicated. Um, there is a paper that we made, um, and we put it online, but I'll try and explain this as best as I can. Um, what we've done is we're working on a new model. <clears throat> it's based on European farms for the time being. We're more than happy to try this out with um, some US producers, so if you're interested, uh, please come see me afterwards. Um, so anyhow, what we're trying to do <clears throat> is figure out 
the, the trade-off uh, decisions for a producer, when you give it two controls, you say, I want you to minimize my methane emissions, but I don't want you to have an impact on my costs or on my ROI or my production. So you give it these two variables. And what the algorithm is now able to do is it actually does millions of computations, comparisons of different decision points. It predicts into the future and comes back with individual CAL recommendations that would result in an optimal balance between methane and ROI. And one of the examples that this algorithm gave us was individual cow voluntary waiting period adjustments. And what we understand from a lot of producers that we work with is that VWP, for instance, is fairly constant. You don't really change that on a per cow basis. But what the algorithm was telling us that if you actually did this, you would be able to make more efficiency gains in methane and you'd be able to make more efficiency gains on your ROI. It's something that we gotten certification of our approach from the European government and we were able to demonstrate with one farm that we were able to remove about seven and a half tons of methane using this type of an approach. Like I said, this is something that we still want to try out in the United States. <clears throat> now, those are some examples of how we're applying AI in the dairy world. However, we believe that this application ultimately is about eliminating heuristics. It's about using data and making it understandable so we can start to apply this. However, <clears throat> when you have technologies like AI, applying this to the real world presents a different set of challenges. Things that you may not have thought about um, as an engineer or as a data scientist. And step number one is training these models or training algorithms requires an enormous amount of data. In fact, when I talk to my team, they'll normally say to me, well, and I say, to them, hey, how much data do you need? And they're like, well, there's, there's no limit. <laughs> Everything you've got, I will take it. Um, just to give you an example, the way that um, OpenAI has trained their models uh, for chat GPT, they're essentially crawling the internet. So Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, where people are having actual conversations is where they're getting their data from, right? So they're actually using the internet to train models. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of data there. As a consequence, when it comes to training algorithms for dairy, you're going to need a lot of data, which means that we have to work together to ensure that we are able to access the data so we can then um, train algorithms on top of it. Now, one of the examples that I could um, give you of the complexity of how much data is technically needed, if we're going to try and train carbon verification models or sustainability models, typically you need about 10 years of historical data, more than 100 fields that you need from this data set, and you need, there are about five different stakeholders involved, from feed companies to producers to processors, all of whom need to come together to try and create these models that I was talking about earlier. There is an enormous amount of data required to train these models. However, at the same time, when we talk to producers, it's very clear data and data management is not exactly why a lot of them get out of bed in the morning. Um, it's not really the same. And we understand, and we've known this for a while, is that we're going to have data manage, we're going to need to make data management disappear from the job to be done from producers. But at the same time, we do need access to data. And that's a bit of a dilemma, and that's something that we need to figure out um, as businesses as to how do we make this simple for producers. And I'll show you some of the simplicity in just a little bit. The second question, the second adoption challenge is, these are interesting technologies, but they have to have a real-world impact. 
So adoption has to be driven by ROI. So if we're coming up with new algorithms that can help producers like yourselves make better decisions, well, we have to make sure that you're getting an ROI by adopting these technologies, right? So technology has to prove itself that it can actually provide a return in your investment, whether that is time, money, or otherwise. And that's another adoption challenge. And it has to be really, really simple. And simply, simple is hard to do. Simple isn't easy. And the reason why simplicity in technology isn't easy is that you're essentially, when you simplify something, you take the onus of the interpretation upon yourself as a tech company. So to the right is systems that you may be familiar with. Uh, I don't know if I can name names, uh, but those are some of the advanced technology systems um, that some of you might be using. What you may or may not realize is that when you're shown data, the responsibility of interpreting that data is upon you. And therefore, your interpretation, and a lot of you would be trained, but if somebody is new, somebody's junior, somebody's just learning, their interpretation may not be the same as somebody highly experienced. Algorithms, on the other hand, properly trained AI algorithms, actually do just that. They're trained on an enormous amount of data. And when algorithms can give you simple answers, it's the algorithm that takes the responsibility of the interpretation. So what you see on the left, for instance, is, hey, you've got 12 health issues, you've got three cows to inseminate, and I found 10 things of interest for you. Well, when our algorithm gives you this simple guidance, it is also being very responsible. Because if you look at these issues, and these issues are not correct, you go and take a look at the dairy cows, and they're all fine, and the heat um, insights were false, the cows not on heat, you're gonna be very upset because it wasted your time. So that responsibility comes down to tech companies, and that's hard to do. But it needs to be done if we are to see adoption of AI in dairy and in ag. And then the next one <clears throat> that I feel pretty um, strongly about personally as well is safeguards from unintended consequences. And what I mean by this is, um, the power of these algorithms and the power of these technologies um, can lead to things that we may not have thought about. For example, when, let's, let's take, uh, again without naming names, if you take some popular social media applications today, one of the unintended consequences of that is, well, we're spending a lot of time just looking at them. There are actual cases of screen addiction there are actual cases of data being used and it's being sold where you are the product. Now, I don't know what the intentions were of these founders when they started these companies. Perhaps there were some evil nefarious plans, but let's assume that these were unintended consequences which nobody really thought about. However, now that we have this experience of what technology can do, and we're now faced with AI coming into pretty much everything in the future, including farming or dairy, we need to provide safeguards. And one of the safeguards is that business models cannot be built around exploitation of data. The source data that's going to use to be power, that, that's used to power these algorithms to come up with their insights must be controlled by those who are generating it and there must be transparency, there must be controls, and there must be traceability on who has access to my data, what are they doing with it, and can I revoke it at any point? And this is a, it's a business ethics or a business morality question um, that I believe is going to be very key for AI and agriculture. But at the same time, I'm really optimistic. I showed you some interesting examples um, of ChatGPT and DALI, but we aren't living in times where rockets are landing on their feet in tandem. 
the same technology that's been used to create DALI, the same technology that's been used to create ChatGPT, is also being used to predict protein sequencing, which will have huge implications for us. The same technology that I just showed you is also being used, and I think the uh, keynote speaker mentioned some of these, around robotics, around sensors. And these are technologies that are on the verge of massive adoption in the next few years. They will happen, they will come. What are we working on? Me and my team, we're working on an AI that's empowering farmers and their advisors. If you're interested to learn more, or if you would actually like to get a free access to the platform, there's a QR code, try it out, reach out to me. Thank you for your time, open to any questions. No takers? Should I start calling, start picking volunteers? <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for your time again. And if, there's, if you have any questions, just feel free to catch me in the lobby somewhere. I'll be around for the next couple of hours. Again, thank you so much for your time.